Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Darren Potty, and I am the guest curator for the Portrait Gallery of Canada. Today, I'm thrilled to present a presentation by artist Jean-Sébastien Gauthier. Gauthier is one of 19 artists in the current digital exhibition, In Keeping With Myself. In Keeping With Myself features works by 19 contemporary Indigenous and Canadian artists who use self-portraiture as a means of reconciling deeply personal challenges and creating a path towards healing. Each artist explores the internal self as the physical self within the context and constraints of the world around us. The resulting work, artworks create spaces for the artists to fully enact themselves, presenting their med mediations to us, the viewers. Before we begin, I want to take a minute to acknowledge that I am based here in Ottawa on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. On behalf of the Portrait Gallery of Canada, we want to honor the Algonquin people, the traditional custodians of this land. We also pay tribute to all the Indigenous people who call Ottawa home, whether they are local or not. I want to recognize the historic oppression of the original lands, cultures, and peoples in what we now know as Canada, including the continuing discovery of the truth about the residential school system. I want to honor as well as thank the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation for their long tradition of welcoming many nations to this beautiful land and for supporting and raising the voice and values of our host nation. Today, I am thrilled to present Jean-Sébastien Gauthier. Jean-Sébastien is a sculptor, new media artist who adopts diverse forms of inquiry and experimentation to create works of time-based art. To this end, he deploys an interdisciplinary mix of technical and conceptual approaches, ranging from traditional sculptural practice interactive video production, performance art, 3D rendering, and most recently, cutting edge scientific imaging technologies. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your practice, your process, how you got to this place, some of the collaborations you've had, um, and, and where you're off to next. Uh, uh, thank you, take it away. Well, uh, bonjour, hello, tout le monde, everyone. Um, I'm, in Saskatoon, I'm in uh, Treaty 6 territory of, of uh, the Cree, Soto and Métis nations. And I'm, I appreciated the territorial acknowledgement. Uh, so I wanna acknowledge the people here as well. Um, yeah, so I, um, I'm a new media artist, uh, sculptor, and uh, my introduction, I guess, was there earlier. I, I wanna walk everybody through um, my practice, some of my previous works uh, leading to uh, the piece that, ooh, that is actually one copy that's behind me here. Anyway, uh, a sample and hold that, that's in the exhibition. That wasn't a uh, planned uh, like product placement. I was just, it's just in my home, it's my copy. And um, I, uh, yeah, I'd like to share uh, my work and uh, and thank you, Darren, for having contacted me to include me in this exhibit because I I'm really uh, very pleased uh, to be with this uh, great group of artists. I'll try to walk through some of my work, especially uh, focused around um, self portraiture. So I'm sharing an image. Very good. Since about 2015, I've had a focus on uh, science and art. And um, this is a work that I made in 2017 called Face to Face um, that includes an X-ray CT scan of myself. And then with, the, with a, a zebrafish here on, on the left, which is a research animal. Um, and I'll come back to that work, but I sort of want to lead up to my uh, body of work, which generally since about 2012 or even prior has really been very interested in relationships to animals and technology in a very general sense. It's, it's quite broad, but uh, I'm hoping that I can sort of show these different ways that I've been building on these ideas of, of, uh, of relationships. Um, it can be in terms of psychological effect or it can be in terms of uh, just like actually sharing traits. Um, I sort of realized that as I was preparing this, that self-portraiture has been present in a lot of works over the years and wanted to uh, sort of riff on that. So we'll see how that 
that goes, but I'm, that's something that just like came up today as I was preparing. So I'm kind of excited to see where it'll lead as well. Um, so here is uh, some of my earlier sculpture. Um, this one is uh, La Bulle, the bubble. It's a, a bronze sculpture of a, a caiman or a small alligator. Uh, that's like a North American small gator that has like popped a, a bubble. It was made just kind of around the, the like uh, housing bubble, uh, 2012. It was uh, sort of intuitively designed. It's, it's bronze with this kind of um, uh, fiberglass uh, gummy uh, paste that was added on. So it's sort of like a, a resin bubble gum that it had. And um, I was working with this image for quite a long time. I um, generated uh, prior to that, this um, kind of sculpture installation and new media, uh, sort of like a real time film that I was trying to develop. I had a big series of works that I would uh, try to create real time uh, like performance film that would uh, sort of try to dialogue around animals in my body. And, and this work, Phobodrome, which was like a kind of made up um, word that sounded like some kind of um, Cronenbergian title or something, um, was uh, actually a self-portrait as well. Uh, the figure on the right I tilt my head. I don't know if I still look much like that, but uh, that was a self-portrait I had made. <clears throat> and this was a life-size figure of myself that I made. And it was on a turntable and I would puppeteer this, uh, sort of puppeteer this piece behind a, a full wall curtain in a performance space. Um, and I was sort of interested in, um, uh, as like a young person, I had uh, night terrors and like would sleepwalk and stuff. And there's this kind of sense of dread and out of control energy. And um, I was sort of looking into that feeling of dread and the feelings of, uh, of fight and flight um, and the limbic system, this idea of like the body itself having like this primitive aspect that we're connected to reptiles through our shared history. I've got the Vimeo uh, video if somebody wants to watch it, but it was like about 20 minute performance in which I would like animate these objects and use video projection. <clears throat> and the, the entire, <clears throat> pardon me, the entire performance was behind this full screen wall to wall projection in front of the audience. And then the, the screen would raise and I had, I was performing um, and then ingesting all this like pink fluid. And then there was kind of like a ectoplasmic kind of uh, like a vomiting of this, of this. And there's sort of like getting this physical aspect of my experience to transmit. It's like super primitive aspect of our bodies that we could share. Um, it was like sharing that fear and sent like this psychological sense of dread that I was sort of trying to transmit through the performance. And so I was in 2012 and I feel like these works are sort of foundational for a lot of my work. They also involve a lot of risk, person, like in terms of, I guess, perceived risk. It's not like I'm actually uh, in danger or anything, but they're like, I'm really trying to trust myself to create something that I may not be comfortable with and create scenarios where I won't know all the outcomes. So um, that's an example of that kind of work from 2012. It's an unusual creation, but there's the, definitely the relationship between uh, myself and animals. And there was a whole thing around statuary and uh, failure, especially in like um, European traditions, like St. George and the dragon, overcoming fear by slaying the dragon. And I was sort of looking at the, the failure of all the other people and seeing that all the ones who hadn't slain the dragon that would be validated through their failures. Uh, failure is still like a, a pretty important part of practice when you want to be experimental. 
and um, you want to, you know, achieve unexpected results. There's like there's a lot of um, perseverance, stick to itiveness that's required. Um, I guess speaking of resilience, uh, this was a a piece that, uh, which was sort of a step from making this large statuary to uh, co-creating uh, a monument here in Saskatoon for um, White Cap Dakota First Nation. In 2012, it was the bicentennial of the War of 1812, and the Dakota First Nation and their people had been involved in treaties and the conflict of 1812. Um, the Dakota First Nation here uh, felt that they weren't well represented in the monuments that were generated across the country. I mean, now I think there's a lot more dialogue around statuary and inclusivity. And um, this, this work I co-created with um, Adrian Stimson, who's a uh, Blackfoot artist, a uh, wonderful person, and and his partner Ian Grove, who's a interior designer and also a wonderful person. So we, um, the three of us, um, co-created this piece uh, called the Spirit of Alliance, which was made in consultation with um, the community, like White Cap, and then we would present the maquettes to the community and the elders, and they would give us critical points and tell us where to lead the story. Um, and so we uh, created this uh, like a life-size teepee inside of a, a roundabout. It's in a traffic circle, but the circle was really primary to the, to the work itself. And, um, and I, can't, I don't know if you can see it here, but along the ground here and here, there's like a band of steel. It has pictographs that are included that um, are like based on winter counts of significant events from, I guess, 200 years prior to the War of 1812 and, and different um, important events like smallpox, uh, it was one and residential school systems. And it was a great project in terms of dialogues around relationships. Uh, and myself being interested in relationships and, and uh, with, with animals. And, and I, I think around that time, there was some of the elders that we were talking with had talked about like the plant nations and the animal nations and the type of treaties that are, that are, between humans and our relations. And that's spoken to me uh, a lot in terms of where I take my work and that I'm speaking to relations uh, and relationships. Um, yeah, and so in this one, it's like a treaty moment between um, Robert Dixon here, who was uh, Scottish, but had married, um, Totoin, his wife, and their child. So he was Scottish. He represented the queen, but he had married into the Dakota. So these people and this man, who was um, Wabasha, who was also called the Leaf, because he lost an eye in a lacrosse, so he had a patch over his eye, apparently. Uh, but um, this man here is the father of this child, and that's his wife. He's already a member of the community, but he's representing the queen. And then they're inside a teepee, which is like to be the whole territory, was to be the home of indigenous people. And then the dividing line on the ground here was the, the boundary that was created post between Canada and the US uh, post War of 1812. And so, you know, it's, a, it's interesting because to me, to be a part of that, because it was really a counter monument to a lot of the, the national dialogue about 1812 as this Canadian American, uh, when in fact there was like 30 or 40 different indigenous nations that were implicated in the conflict. And, and um, the fact that the Dakota had come here uh, was directly uh, part of those conflicts like they ended up having to 
flee their territories and seek the protection of the queen. And now, uh, you know, they ended up helping settle the, this community that I live in, Saskatoon. And so these are, uh, I mean, that, that's really important to me in terms of seeking to work like from where I am uh, and use myself as, as part of the work. Um, so this was a really important piece to me also because my grandfather was a sculptor, Bill Epp, and he made dozens of monuments among which uh, a, a monument of um, Gabriel Dumont, uh, who's a Métis leader. And um, his first monument, that was his first monument in bronze. And this piece here is uh, maybe 400 meters upriver from his first monument. So there's a kind of, uh, for me, like a kind of arriving at a milestone uh, for me in, in this work. Um, at about the same time, uh, I started, uh, I was asked to prepare uh, like a, another public piece at this time, a, a billboard, temporary billboard um, for Paved Arts, which is a local artist run center. They share a building on 20th Street East here in Saskatoon uh, with AKA artist run. So it's like two artist runs that, that own one building and the front is a, is a billboard space. And I had been, during the monument, actually during the 1812 monument is sort of where the seeds of um, working with um, X-ray imaging came because I, I um, at the time we, we had thought the synchrotron, you know, we wanted to uh, 3D scan a bison as one idea for this project. And so we, I contacted the, the synchrotron people. This is a particle acceleration microscope in Saskatoon. It's, it's the only one in Canada. There's a there's a growing number of them in the world. Uh, last I think it was like forty or fifty, but they they come in all shapes and sizes, and they create these very brilliant light. In any case, they, I kind of got the idea of working with them, and they they said, you know, scanning a bison would be like uh, using a a blowtorch to light a candle, or a jet engine to light a candle, or something, you know, like this was just like way too much to bother um, working with that. And at the same time, I was producing this piece, which I feel was sort of like a prescient work. Um, it's called, they pull the wolves over our eyes or uh, nous sommes loups tout de laine vêtu, which has a different meaning in French. Like we are wolves all in dressed in wool. And so I had taken a photograph of myself, uh, of my eye here, and this is the the kind of wool surrounding. And then on each each of these cubes that you see have um, stereograms. They're uh, they're like magic eye images. And so each of them was. I can leave this on for a little bit and see if I can see it. I can't remember which one this is. I don't know if you're able to do these ones. It's been a while, but. I practiced a lot while I was making them. Yeah, you are a wolf in sheep's clothing is what this one says. And then there was an image, these kind of blurry images of, of, uh, of wolves and then sheep. The idea of this was to sort of create a, a structure where uh, information was, was controlled by the spaces uh, around you. So, you could see this billboard and it would look like what you're seeing here. But if you knew that you wanted to see the other information, you needed to enter the building and just ask anybody there that, to see the billboard. And then they would open up a panel, like a door that was here, it's, it's right there. This door that you could get through, the gatekeepers could sort of let you through that door onto this balcony. And on the balcony, if you knew how to look at these stereograms, you could get this other read of the work. And so it sort of ended up being this kind of prescience to the kind of work I would be following, which is um, with art science and, and not knowing how to do things with uh, scientific imaging, but knowing I wanted to use scientific imaging somehow, and then having to figure out how to get access to 
to the information I wanted to to find. At this time, I started um, pursuing uh, just from having a tour of the synchrotron, having visited and called them. I sort of started pursuing uh, a a collaboration and. And, and uh, by chance on the tour I was taking of the synchrotron, a friend of mine, it turns out worked there. And I told him I wanted to use it to make art. And they were kind of like, well, <laughs> no, but you could, you could ask for somebody. So I, I ended up putting out this call and I got a couple emails back about trying to, uh, I guess it was 2016, 2015, 16, the, um, the Canada Council had this grant that was for science and artists, scientists and artists to work together towards like a publication and an art exhibit. And I put out this call to get somebody to take this, apply for this grant. And I have met uh, this man uh, on the right, the bearded man. He's not always bearded, but that's uh, Brian Eames. And we ended up hitting it off and becoming collaborators. And I guess it's been like five or six years and I've been the artist in residence in his um, labs at the university. But um, we ended up over the next two years from 2015 to 2017, uh, seeking that grant. They canceled that grant just a week after. And so, uh, we just kept applying uh, for grants and, and um, ended up being uh, with the project within measure, uh, one piece of which you see here on the right, um, being the first, like it was the first art project that got beam time at the Canadian Light Source. And, and in the background of the image here, you can sort of see this big blurry, um, site but it's it looks like kind of like the a marvel movie without all the tactile screens or something you know like it, it's maybe dialed down a bit but it's this big you know uh particle accelerator um i should say that brian is um yeah he works in the in the department of anatomy physiology and pharmacology and he um he works with zebrafish, which are the animals depicted in the, in the piece that I have. And all of the images we see here on the right are like embryos of zebrafish. And so these are adult, that's, a, that's the same model of an adult female, which is the one that I'm also holding in my self-portrait. And then here is, uh, I believe that's a 15 hours, 72 hours, uh, two days, that's a stage 15. So that's an older specimen. And uh, I guess this is the same as this, it's the same as this, not quite symmetrical. Um, but it, it, the idea was to sort of show this developmental time frame and see if we could make art and science sort of together. Um, that piece is pretty heavily inspired by Ernst Haeckel, who, uh, whose ideas on, uh, who just like identified a huge amount of species and was himself sort of like an amateur scientist, I guess in the time that he worked, I mean, the disciplines were much less cloistered uh, than they are now in terms of art, art and practice. Uh, but he's a phenomenal illustrator as well and painter. And so th these works were sort of like uh, uh, an attempt to respond to his work, uh, art forms in nature, Kunst forms in nature. Um, this work was still life after him, after Ernst Haeckel and uh, was a print, but also because in this case, rather than reproducing from Micros microscopy. Um, these are X-ray micro microscopy. So um, it creates a, like a 3D image of the entire specimen. And so it's sort of like a, a resampling of that 
uh, to create um, these other forms of representation of, of these animals. And zebrafish were, I've been asked pretty often, like why zebrafish? And um, they're super robust in terms of their relationship with science. They are able to regrow their uh, fins and parts of their skulls at different stages. And they have incredible regenerative powers because they're low on the uh, food chain. Apparently they, they live in the, the Ganges in India, which I thought was pretty interesting. And they're, um, they're somewhat transparent. Uh, they can sort of hide they look like zebras with these like bands of black, but they can uh, contract those black um, pigment cells and kind of become transparent to hide in the reeds. And they're minnow sized. So they're, you know, they adult as adults, they'd be uh, uh, sorry, the adult fish would be three to four centimeters along. And then some of these, um, central ones, they're, they're more like um, the tip of a, so if I looked at a piece here, like this early stage is about the tip of a ballpoint pen, just a tiny little egg. Um, and in this case, the cells are only really on the top and below here is a yolk of primal goo or something. <laughs> uh, so I'll just, um, this is just to show this kind of, uh, the result that you get from a, from a 3D scan. It, this is like a, inside of a tube and you can see the zebrafish here. And then as you sort of alter your uh, different color values in the scans themselves, you get uh, access to different information uh, as to what the internal structure of the animal is. And that's why it's used so prevalently in, in scientific imaging. They call it like a non-invasive or non-destructive um, imaging. It's invasive in that it, the specimens are not able to take that kind of uh, radiation load. It would be fatal. So they do have to be stained. And I had to learn how to create um, these uh, I had to learn how to do these uh, scientific procedures in the lab. So I was sitting in the lab and, and working with the, like with uh, lab technicians and, and learning how to image them and using different uh, chemical uh, stains basically to, to add like heavy metals and minerals into the, into the specimens that had been, uh, this was a female, uh, zebrafish and uh, it was quite egg laden and uh, you can see they have barbs here on their front so this is the same fish that's represented in in the other work and uh, like I said before like I'm I was entering into a relationship with these animals and as scientific specimens and as samples um, and there's like a whole uh, ethic of relationships that was to be observed and was, you know, like this, when is a creature alive and when is it, you know, like I had to take the ethical training uh, for, for um, being in the lab and being working with animals. And I was working like every day with, with the animals. And this was another kind of conceptual uh, output we were looking to create, which was like a kind of um, matryoshka, the Russian dolls, that, that one inside another. But here it's the um, the smaller, um, the younger forms, and trying to kind of lead them into their uh, later states. And um, in this case, the, I processed those three D models in, in such a way that they. They didn't show the inside of the, um, the specimens necessarily because the imaging technology, like it creates like very, very large um, data sets. It's like, it's like a, it, it's kind of like a, you know, a, 
if you were to shoot uh in like for photographic terms you would shoot like a like a reel of 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 like 2700 black and white images and and each image you would stack into this volume and then you select which pixels will be transparent or not and that's what we were seeing earlier in the, in the zebrafish as well um and so coming back to kind of putting myself in relationship with the animal at the same time as I was working with these animals and like euthanizing these tiny little, uh, you know, eggs that are like, you know, minnow eggs and letting them grow to certain stages. And then, uh, you know, they're in, in the labs themselves. Brian's work is around, like his research is based on finding treatments for osteoarthritis and cartilage uh, it turns out cartilage and bone have very similar genetic markers, but they have different uh, evolutionary kind of like moments that they're that they that they appear. And um, some of his work is sort of around figuring out which um, we call them gene regulatory networks are responsible for the creation of different types of strata of um, cartilage in your bones to treat like arthritis in the knees and be able to help uh, regenerate um, and treat different different uh, illnesses and so being face to face with the fish in the image is sort of a way of of um, i guess like paying respect also to the the relationship that we share to like common ancestry were from the same source i guess is the and it was as i was working on these fish i ended up having what i thought might be a stroke and i had to go to the hospital and get an x-ray ct scan and it turned out i had been having these kind of unusual migraines that i didn't know i and so i had a, like a ct scan and so i went to the hospital to get my um, medical records and downloaded it on a DVD. They gave me it for $25. They gave me the DVD of my medical files, which I have the right to. And, and uh, they provided that to me. And, and so I began to use that as another point of contact, I think, in terms of the relationship with the animal. This idea of sort of performing and putting myself into a context where I'm gonna have to work. I'm working in a situation that I'm not, What's the word like um like i'm implicated in the ethic that i'm trying to explore i didn't prepare myself to make a work about zebrafish i just followed the intuition of working with the technology and i guess something i didn't really mention much prior is that that's a, a big part of the work i feel like i like i studied at concordia and in, especially in the sculpture this kind of expanded field of, of work was really was really um, prevalent in, in sort of our training was to sort of reach reach out and try to like push the work into the shape it needed and or or to shape to take technologies and use them outside of their intention to see if we could make other work occur and I think that's really common in sort of from a traditional sculptural background as well, um, you know, that you adapt, you see new ideas and new possibilities and you adapt them to the practice. Um, this, that work also, uh, sorry, is that playing audio? No, okay, phew, I'm gonna talk over it because it's playing on mine. But this was a, an installation that came from the work. Um, but. It, the uh, the fish scan that we produced we ended up I ended up uh, turning it into like a, a 3D milled object and so it, it, interestingly it, when you work with 3D scans it's almost like the animal or the sample you know but the the body of the animal is the negative and you're beaming the light through them onto the sensor and then you're moving that sample to get all these projections. And so it's working like black and white photography. And, um, and what we did was end up generating these surfaces that could be 
uh, 3D printed or milled. And, and these are rear projection screens. And I had sensors on the street and um, people walking by this busy area on Nuit Blanche in Saskatoon, when they would walk by from the parking lot across to the movie theater on a busy Friday night, as they would trigger uh, as they walk by these sensors that would just blow up these, uh, you know, pen tip sized uh, zebrafish embryos to like monumental scale. And, and it also has sort of a soundtrack made by uh, Andy Rudolph um, from, from Winnipeg, uh, who's a very talented sound artist and, and designer. So it was like this kind of trying to sort of share the, the scale of the animals as statuary, but also just like bringing them into contact with us in a different way was really important. And so this is an example of this kind of uh, interactive installation where people could, uh, like on the left, you can see um, this, uh, that's that same Haeckel piece, but they would sort of circle around. Uh, it, it would sort of rotate and stuff. And uh, I presented the work again in, uh, at Beakerhead, which is like a kind of science engineering festival in Calgary in 2018. And it was really fun to go take it there and just again, have like large amounts of people uh, to talk to of like all ages and, and share the work. And here I'm holding that, that uh, zebra fish as like a physical object, uh, which there's two of those, I guess. One one is Brian's. I gave it to Brian, and the other one's at the studio. Um, but I ended up using this to generate the portrait um, sample. And hold is like one of my favorite Neil Young songs from this album Trance from like 1980. Um, and so it was this idea of bringing uh, the sample and just holding it, but also of talking about a uh, relationship with technology and information and the relationship with animals as information, which I think is really intriguing um, and disquieting for me uh, of thinking of, of us as uh, sort of sampling different parts of life forms now and and taking that uh, into the future, it's like, what would uh, what will we be <laughs> when we start copying and pasting our shared genetic kind of heritage? I don't know that I'm, I, I'm not really ethically kind of, I don't, I, I'm not taking a stand, I guess, in terms of what ethics I like I have my own beliefs like I'm not sure about a lot of things but I'm sort of putting myself in the situation where I have to endure both aspects of the process I at least that's my hope is that I'm not in a neutral space that I'm actually engaged in trying to be involved in the dialogue with technology and and so that was it was a really interesting space to enter in dialogue with the lab with scientists and bringing these ideas about about um uh, what does it feel to to be related to the fish how does it feel to be related to them and and i was writing like letters i don't know that's kind of unusual but i was sort of writing letters to to the fish to explain myself to them i guess um as like a um, it's like a compassionate relationship. Like how, how could I not use them, I guess is the, and I think that's a, that's a really important part of our relationship with technology is not seeing it as a, as seeing the technology as a relationship rather than a, a means of production. Um, that seems to be informing a lot of what I'm doing now, which is sort of, stepping back from computers, thanks to COVID and isolation and Zoom, uh, stepping way back from computers and um, getting in, 
into woodworking and I've been for the last year, like carving one tree trunk that was uh, that felled at my parents' house uh, where my studio is in the, in the country at an acreage. And it's like a tree my grandfather planted, you know, or probably around my birth because old photos don't show them. And um, it's a tree that like I have, like I grew up in the shade of that tree. Uh, it's a kind of a group of trees. And that wood has been the only thing I'm working with for, like it was, it was a pretty big uh, poplar from there. Uh, and I've had enough material to sort of learn how to make some chairs and things, I guess. It's like a very different uh, maybe angle here, but but the idea of being closely related to the material has been really steady and growing in terms of how I want to work, just having really strong relationships. And I think part of the thing I learned from, from working with scientists was sort of like what the drive, like the shared drive of creative work in science and in, in art is, is novelty a lot, um, like finding a new result for scientists, you know, a new, a novel, repeatable result is what Brian would say, you know, that's like the, the goal, you know, this new discovery that evidence is clear for. And in, in art, novelty is the same and you want to create novelty, but you, as in you want to find a this new form of expression or new representation or or a new way of using a technique that's established within practice, but not repeatably necessarily. Repeatability is not really central. It's more like a unique moment that this uh, expression is occurring. And so working with digital technologies really flips the sort of repeatability aspect in an interesting way. And there's a lot of artists who've worked with like facsimile of other artworks. And so I uh, sample and hold, I recreated as a 3D printed object here, which is, this is only like a 14 inches. I think I actually have it. Yeah, it's on the shelf over behind me, but it's a small, I, I regenerated that self portrait and I used some of my scan and then other parts of myself to, to generate like a, uh, a 3D model and then, uh, on the wall behind this, like a shadow projection here. This is uh, like an actual facsimile, like it's a large scale photocopy of m the same image rendered. Uh, so when you'd walk in the room, you would see the sculpture and then the this, this piece, this like black and white um, photocopy, just like large scale photocopy pinned to the wall. And so there's this, this kind of, I think, sidestepping of what the original is, or but the relationship is present. And I think that's the most important aspect of the works. It was like holding on to the relationship because the, the materiality and the, the way that it can be shown is really diverse. And I, I don't know that that's necessarily present for others, but for me it was like being like with with the creature how do i yeah and then this might be a little blurry but I, that same model could then serve as like a, a rendering like a video output or something um so i i don't know it's like kind of been the work was sort of like flailing about trying to learn science and learn imaging and x-ray imaging and how could I use it to express uh, something. And um, it sort of generated all this potential, out, all these potential outputs throughout. So the original is sort of the, the negative is the, the actual specimen. And then everything from then on is just, um, digitally uh, reworked. And, and so the, the 3D model that's present on, on in the exhibit is sort of another output of the same source material. Um, there's sort of like archives of 3D 
objects. I, I just threw these in as well, like because this idea of like original creative, original creativity, or, and like it's kind of the primitive streak is actually like uh, we started imaging uh, chicken and frog, and as well as the fish to try to show these uh, uh, homologous uh, homologous uh elements of like what we share and i ended up scanning this what we see on the the left here is a this is a chicken embryo and this is the uh, venus of willendorf and for there's this band where there's an arm across the the breast that was sort of mimicked in this chick and so i um uh, i just made a this representation to sort of bring them together. And they were sort of, they were displayed in a, an exhibit here around cabinets of curiosity, which are, you know, fitting for this kind of embryo, embryonic creatures. And, and also like, you know, Venus of Willendorf, which is like 24,000 year old sculpture, uh, like hominid, who knows if it was, our species or, or Neanderthal, I, I don't really know, but I, I'm really interested in that relationship with, with like ancient creative practice, like unnamed, I guess. I, don't know. I um, the, something really interesting there that I think is, is generating a lot of direction now for the work. And uh, I'm like waving my hand around like, a, I'm not sure. Um, this was just a an interesting sort of joke name for for uh, one of the samples we imaged. This is like a. I just thought it was such a compelling image through the microscope of a. Uh, this is one of the chicken embryos. This is about like I think nine days or nine or twelve days post fertilization. And I keep thinking of this like because I've got a four-year-old and I was working, like I basically started working with embryos when my partner was pregnant and for his like whole uh, childhood. And then I was listening to this Raffi song and they were like, it's a strange animal, the chicken who, who, uh, who serves us before it's born and after it is dead, something like that. And I thought this is really interesting because it, you know, I, I kind of, intuit my way into relationships with the content that I'm exploring. And then the chicken is like this huge part of art history. And uh, again, with this woodworking interest of mine right now, the, the, uh, the creation of, of iconic panels, you know, over, over the centuries, there's like this technique of using just the right um, wood grain oriented panels to create the stability that could hold the egg tempera, which is like this, you know, tre tremendous long lasting paint, but it's super brittle. And so there's a, there's a lot of kind of uh, back and forth with, in terms of dialogue where the work will be going. Uh, I'm not sure um, how that works. I, I just threw in a few slides around what the the stages of development are and what some of these embryos might look like like here's some of those chicken embryos and the zebrafish embryos they're much more transparent little creatures and this um the phylotypic stages are are sort of like they will diverge here they will diverge quite a bit in their development at early stages they come to a period uh within this uh you know theory of evolution where they share a great many um, physical traits in development. And you can see that quite well in even, uh, I guess, Haeckel, the, like this image in particular is like a really important um, image of an uh, anthropogeny, uh, anth I'm gonna say it like anthropogeny, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, that image was really contested actually, but it's like one of the most well established like artistic images about like evolution. He was really into, um, but, but his uh, images were really 
doctored quite a bit in terms of the stages. And now the, the research is really going into this kind of uh, genetic similarities where the forms may not look the same, but they may be related to the same uh, genes. And so there's this really interesting divergence. Uh, the work that I continued working with, with Brian with uh, involves sort of trying to show those aspects of multiple species. Um, and so we made a, like I made a, for New Blanche 2019, the last New Blanche I could go outside. No, I, yeah, we generated in actually the same space as, as the year two before, I think it was the year before, we got access to the same space and um, generated this, um interactive installation where the audience the people could come in and by opening and closing their hands they could like grab the samples so these are people at nuit blanche uh, you know trying to manipulate uh, this like group of uh here's like a frog embryo or uh the frogs are on this side here starting to lose its tail this one is a uh, fish and then there's a chick there with a fish in front of it so you get the sense of each of the the specimens and you could if you walked in you could if you closed your hand on one of the rings on those little dots then it would sort of spread them apart but you can you can sort of see the different um embryos of these different research animals uh that one in the front is a frog embryo, one with the green circle. And uh, and you learn all these really neat things about the, the creatures too. Like this frog, Xenopus lavis, this is Xenopus tropicalis, but Xenopus lavis was like the, um, the original uh, pregnancy test was these frogs in labs and you can see it in old like midwife movies or something like these jars of frogs in the hospitals and they would use uh frogs as um if if uh if a woman's urine had the like the same as a test if it had certain hormones those female xenopus lavis frogs would lay eggs if the if they were pregnant now, how people figured that out is a mystery to me. There's like a, going to the pond for a tinkle and eventually they were like, these frogs are special. But, um, you know, it, it becomes this space of playing uh, with these creatures and it's sort of, um, but, but putting ourselves, you know, in, a, in some kind of relationship with them. I feel like it's been really tough figuring out how to show work with these intentions and, and dialogue, not as like a scientific illustration, but as like a, that's a kind of one of the big tests I think of the work. But some of the images actually, like I had one scan that was like actually went into a scientific publication, which was like kind of like the, even though we didn't get that grant, because they canceled the program, we still did it. We still had our shows. And I didn't publish a paper, but I, I had a I had a frog in a in a science paper. So um, yeah, these are just other other images of that piece, hourglass, which was about our forms. And I think, yeah, that's sort of my special thanks. I had put in some of the groups that had funded my work over the years, but also I I realized I had put uh, the National Portrait Gallery, but it didn't save it. So I just wanted to say thanks, Darren, for, for the opportunity as well. Thank you again. Um, you know, one thing that uh, uh, I find is that because your practice is so science and, and technology driven, um, many people get caught up in the process and describe your work as the intersection between science and art, almost as if it didn't have a long history before that, almost as if this is a new intersection that's being created or, or as if you know they didn't have a relationship the whole time, and I think I think you brought it up uh, really nicely when you when you kind of reference um, other kind of science artists. And you kind of said you know back in the day it wasn't so 
so siloed, so it's kind of separate. I wonder if you could just expand your experience. Do you feel like you're explaining um, the art side of things to the scientists all the time, the science things to the art artists all the time? Like, do you find people are missing out because they're focusing on the process and not on some of the kind of critical um, aspects of this, or, or do you find that there's a, a wide divide, or that divide is is quite small? And that's kind of a big, big uh, question, but it's more. Well, it, it, you know, I don't general. know that yeah. there's a. I think generally there's like. The, the thing that I really respect and enjoyed about working outside of the arts for a while and going into this other context was that like scientists are really curious and really intelligent and really engaged. And so they, they were really open to other perspectives, especially Brian. Like I really like, he's, he's just a pleasure to work with. Like he's really engaging and curious and interesting and we're quite close friends as well like over the years, it's one of my closest friends, you know, so we can work um, really well together. And it's not, maybe it's somewhat easier sometimes than working with other artists. Although I've been really lucky to work with, you know, like a lot of people and I really enjoy collaboration. So it's been, I'm lucky that I've had so many collaborations, especially like Adrian Stimson and Ian and uh, Jason Berg and I have worked a lot. Um, and it's just really fun, you know, to collaborate. And, uh, and you don't end up with the same results as when you're uh, plotting, you know, a course on your own to, to your work. For me, it, it creates a sort of, I like, I like these intensities in production, sort of like calm and then, and then intensity, but um, yeah, I, I think it's been harder to talk about it in an artistic context than, and sharing like how much uh, groundwork was necessary. Like I remember, um, I think it's like during my undergrad hearing some interview with like Christo and Jean Claude and they talked about like how much their practice was admin of like just dialogue and like figuring out like what was necessary and like being able to work with this content is like so labor intensive to figure out how to do work with scientists like I had to, I negotiated with like science companies, like science imaging companies to like get licenses for these like insanely expensive softwares cheaply or, you know, like it was just like, uh, but, you know, the, the work sort of, um, maybe it's a, like, I really enjoy, I guess I enjoy a challenge. I'm not sure maybe I play video games that I lose at a lot or something. And I've generated some, some uh, tolerance for failure from that. And from my practice, I feel like I just try stuff and uh, nothing seems to work out as planned, but also the, the, you know, going through like uh, digesting things and making them meaningful and trying to make things meaningful. Like, I feel like that's part of the work. Uh, that I want to partake in, that I want to, I guess that I feel that that's the responsibility maybe of, of the artist is like, you're, yeah, it has to be meaningful to us so that it'll be meaningful to others. And there's the risk of, of having to really stand for something or, or just to really do it, you know. Um, I, I feel like the, yeah, there's like this this line between science and art that's not, I guess, between all disciplines that's really necessary to question. I really liked discovering a lot of Buckminster Fuller's writings. There's one I really love, um, and it came to pass, but not to stay. It's a very kind of lyrical book where he explains sort of his take on the world. But he was like a real proponent for uh, being a generalist not being an expert. And I felt like that was a really interesting place to try to engage with scientific community who are like super deeply focused on these very particular regions of, of interest and then coming in 
as like a total outsider and saying, I'd like to, I want to use this tool, but I don't even, they're like, well, you don't even know what it does. And I'm like, I do, I don't know if I need to, to make something meaningful, like what I put in there or uh, what I put in between the beam and the sensor. There's also like, what does it mean to put something in that beam? And maybe that gets esoteric as well, but I think there's something valid to, to trying to play in that space. Um, that, that, that's interesting to, to all sides. Yeah, that's my long-winded other answer, Darren. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, some of that kind of uh, got me thinking a little bit too about some of the kind of challenges that, that traditional galleries would have in exhibiting your work. You know, it, it worked well with us. It was an online exhibition, you know, we're in COVID, everyone's on their screens anyways. And so I was actually able to really get in and, and see the fish and, and kind of work around it and kind of feel the same way you did and get really close to it through the screen it was very interactive but then the publication the the catalog associated with it it's an image it's static and then you have the 3d model so so i'm kind of curious um and you've shown a couple with the uh with the nuit blanche kind of installations but i'm kind of curious what kind of challenges or or how you can kind of see we might be moving towards um showing some of this kind of uh multimedia work uh, in the future or um even just some of the kind of okay how do i how do i conceptually think about someone who can play with the embryos in the same way that I am well you know how did how, how are those kind of challenges coming to be that was a, that was a long-winded question to your long-winded answer last time yeah, but yeah. I do I, uh, in general yeah I think that's a real of traditional galleries yeah yeah I think you, I think the interaction aspect of like how do you make the this content meaningful to people uh, like for me like so much of sculpture is touch based it's like our first sense we develop you know uh and there's sort of this idea of like the pri the, the order of development of senses is sort of like what their priorities are in terms of of evolution which i think is interesting so it's you know sculpture is really thinking with your hands a lot to me and uh, that's been part i think of the relationship that that was sort of lacking in in the work for me like not in the lab working with microscopes and actually like we invented some techniques to like fix the samples in place and all these sculptural aspects of sort of my skill set were all of a sudden useful in the process but um it, it's been it's been tricky working with technology because and rendering and stuff because the aesthetic of a lot of digital production is like so refined and, and pretty. And I think, like I was thinking, uh, there's this quote that I really like by um, Cocteau, Jean Cocteau, who's like, tout, tout ce qui n'est pas cru reste décoratif. Everything that is not raw remains decoration or decorative. And is this kind of rawness I want to keep in the in-between of this, um, in this, this messiness of creativity that I want to keep. And uh, I think that's been drawing me back to physical interactions. And although it, those ones I made for, for that Nuit Blanche show were like perfect COVID safe. Because you could, you could walk up to these sensors at a distance and you wouldn't have to touch them. But, uh, you know, we, I got into VR and stuff to try to, figure out how to get people to relate to it as spatially, you know, and it's, that's been, that was really exciting, but became this another hurdle, another technical hurdle. And I feel like a lot of the technical, like, I think that project was like dealing with learning walls, not, not like curves, just like bang. Now you got to figure out how to learn all this stuff to be able to step past. So I feel like um, simplifying <laughs> is gonna be helpful for the future. Uh, I think that's what's been leading me back to, to tangible practices of 
and probably like going back to your your roots in a way from from this it's like sculpture and approaching i i mean i do i do work with 3d printing and i quite quite enjoy that and this lends itself excellently um but each i think maybe as the time goes and processing power and computer powers increase the data sets that we generated will also be easier to process um but you know, there's like terabytes of of scans. I think maybe there's like 80 or so scans we generated and uh, because I had access to their like desktop CT scanner as well. And there's a lot of uh, stuff where we was like making a 3D print and then putting my head inside this as a container to like hold other samples and stuff and scans that sort of we were hoping that we can make the like 3D scans be the source material. It, actually, like the compositions being these micro objects that would translate. And I think that's still in the cards eventually. Uh, but uh, when COVID hit, you could get a haircut in Saskatchewan, but you couldn't work in a sterile medical lab uh, at the university medical research facility. So that was early in and now researchers are back, but art is still a secondary. So um, you know, hopefully I can get back to it and also work with, with Brian and other scientists and other fields. Cause I, I mean, I guess too, I've been presenting some other work. I did a piece called ground recently with uh, the Mackenzie in, in Regina. Um, I got contacted by John Hampton, their director and curator. And uh, I had um, a story that my grandmother shared about um, like pulling pemmican from the ground here. But she, she grew up in the 20s in Saskatchewan, 20s and 30s. And uh, when they turned the land in that territory, they would find like food stashes. So I um, I 3D scanned some of the ingredients and uh, and then reprojected that content onto the ground and walls. Just try to put back some of the some of this kind of just put respect and acknowledge that one form of sustenance that was valid was was displaced. Maybe yeah, I can share that, but I guess it's for another day. But uh, yeah, it's for another day, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm rambly. I'm rambly, Taryn. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> we, we'll uh, we'll post again some links so that people can follow along and see some of ground and see some of uh, of what you're up to in the future. See some of the wood carving. Um, thank you again for the wood carving. Thank you again for the shape. Yeah. <laughs> yes, spoons. Yes, yeah. bowls. <laughs> Next, salt cellars eventually. Um, yeah, I'll work. I'm working up to, uh, yeah, for Christmas presents here. Oof, Spoons That's and good. stuff. Yeah. No, but I'm, uh, yeah, no. All right. Sorry. Thank you again.